Education uh, from the University of Leicester. Uh, John's work is kind of well known to us from some of the stuff he's done around assessment, uh, students belonging and also retention work. Um, but today specifically, um, John's going to be talking to us about some work he's been doing, looking at transitions into university and between years as well, and particularly important in the context of the thing that's been uh, reflected in a lot of the presentations over the last couple of days, the, uh, the changes around the pandemic and the opportunities and challenges that's, been, that's brought to us. So without further ado, I'll hand over to John and thank you very much again, John, for coming and speaking with us today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Trevor. I hope everyone can hear me OK. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say just before I begin, I think this has been a really fantastic conference. I feel quite privileged to have listened to quite a lot of the talks and indeed quite a lot of them have talked about and touched on transitions and student support. So I hope that some of the things I'll be saying will chime with what you've been thinking about as well. So as we know, all levels of the student learning experience through education, from reception through to doctoral studies have been affected by the pandemic. And some of these changes are going to be long lasting, not just from the students, but also they're going to change the way in which our institutions are thinking about higher education. And for, for the purpose of this talk today, I just want to think about two cohorts of students who I know will be at the forefront of the minds of everyone attending this conference. And as I say, people have touched on this already. So we can think about the current year 13 students who will be progressing to university in September. And also the current first year undergraduates will be progressing into year two this September as well, hopefully. And indeed they will have likewise had quite a strange experience. I would also add the caveat, um, this is quite a personal perspective and so it will be partial in different ways, but I hope it'll be thought provoking. We'll have some content for everybody that will be of interest. So, <clears throat> Transitions into and with it, within higher education have they've always been identified as being challenging for the student who's trying to negotiate the changes in the academic and social spaces that they occupy. And for the institutions who are trying to support individual learning experiences, but on a large scale, some of the institutions might have two or three thousand new students, but they have to bear in mind that there is no typical student. They will all have their own individual backgrounds. They will have their own journeys that they've come on and have to make. And obviously this year, despite the best efforts of schools and universities, there's been significant disruption to academic provision and the formal learning experience that students have had. The Institute for Fiscal Studies calculates that school students would have missed between half and two thirds of a school year's teaching. And it's not just the teaching, it's also the changes to the social learning experience and the sense of belonging, which we know impacts on student resilience and retention. So what I want to do is to um, use three quotes as the sort of background to this presentation. <clears throat> They're all quite old ones which reflect the fact that, as I say, student transitions have been something that people have focused on and thought about for a long time. I think this one from Holsworth is really significant in this context. Transitions are recognised as more individualised, reflective and fragmented. And the fragmented element also identifies the fact that transitions aren't just a one off. Students don't just go from being a school or college student to a university student overnight. They don't even do that at the end of induction, but they are continually going through transitions as they adapt to the academic life, the different styles of teaching from college to university and from university first year to second year. So they have to adapt to the academic expectations. They're also establishing their social groupings within the institution that the student is part of. And so there are significant transitions in terms of the relationships the students will have with their home environments. And these will be different 
for students who live on campus as against those who live at home. And it's the coming together of all these different transitions and integrations, the academic, the social, the domestic, if you like, that feed into students' sense of belonging, their persistence and their success. And these have been affected in different ways by the pandemic. So Holdsworth quote, although it's <clears throat> from 15 years ago now, is still very, very relevant. And likewise, and Tinto's comment as well about the three stages, separation, transition and incorporation. So the incorporation is the student becoming part of the body of the university. And I want also to include one other quote, <clears throat> which academics in particular need to be and probably are aware of this one from Moffat from his study of American students that at least half of college is what went on outside the classroom. It's the social integration. And that is a very important part of student persistence and success because it feeds into well-being. So as I say, this year, the transitions will be even more individualised, reflected, reflective and fragmented than ever before. Um, in a very timely publication, Unite Students just this morning published um, the results of a survey that show that only 36% of this year's prospective intake feel ready for university, which is a drop from 45% from just a couple of years ago. And just under 20% actually feel well informed about the universities that they're going to. So <clears throat> we need to be thinking about these transitions in lots of different ways. And I'm going, to, as I say, I'm going to touch on some of these as we go through the presentation. There are also some other aspects that we need to think about as well. And I think the first one is that despite all these issues, the positive story is that higher education is still seen as a key route for progression. At the, at the, at the close of the initial application process, the UCAS application data from February showed that 504,000 UK applicants had applied to university, which is up 8% on 2020. And the application rate for 18 year olds is at 42.6%, which is a record. Also, that change has been is seen across all the IMD the index of multiple deprivation quintiles. So we've, we see an increase in the uptake even from uh, right across that, even from quintile one, which is the highest level of social deprivation. So that's good news, but the structural differences still exist. So 56% of 18 year olds in quintile five applied dropping to 31% for quintile one. And of, but an even starker picture is that 25% of males in quintile one applied. So this is something that universities are having to address through their five year access and, particip access and participation plans for the Office for Students to set out ways they're addressing this widening access but also how they'll reduce the progression and attainment gaps in terms of student disadvantage, ethnicity, disability, gender in particular. And that's going to represent a specific challenge and a greater challenge this year because COVID's had differential impacts on student learning experiences, both in school and university. Alongside which, as a result of the changes in the ways in which A-level have been A levels have, have been graded and will be graded for the current applicants. Quite a few universities have seen a very positive widening of their student demographic. So just thinking about some of the key factors widening disadvantage for year 13 students and that people need to be aware of, and I'm sure most of you attending this conference are very well aware of. We've got the level of resource availability and provision by schools, which across the country has been 
quite significant in terms of its variation. There's the access to IT equipment and availability at suitable times for studying. So many students in, for example, quintiles one and two have had limited access to IT and because they are competing maybe with other members of the family for use of laptops and so on, they can't necessarily access it at the times they need. Reliable internet provision is a key factor. And one of the major ones that's been fed back through a number of studies is the availability of study space, particularly quiet study space where people can work without being interrupted. And a fifth one, I'm sure you can think of more, but parental support and additional tutoring. One of the um, growth areas, if you like, in acad academia has been the provision of private tutors and they're <clears throat> charging in London quite really quite significant amounts of money for providing additional support for students to get them through GCSEs and A-levels. So all of these factors affect the different types of year 13 students and we've got a differential impact, particularly on those who can't afford all those resources. Now clearly, um, also students studying in schools and colleges will have seen a reduction in face-to-face -face teaching as we've seen, but also as people teaching in STEM are well aware, they've also seen a loss of practical work. And that's something that universities need to be aware of. And again, I'll pick up on that. So many students from year 13 have been affected, but also of course, this is true for undergraduate students. Those in year one who've lived at home and are returning home during the lockdown. And just as an example, I just want to pick up on one aspect, which is around where students are living and the access that they have. So this shows the different groupings of students, where they, where they were living. This is data from the Sutton Trust report that was published just earlier this year, showing how we've got the different social groupings and the proportions of students living at home or studying away. And what you can see here is that the, there is a clear grading in terms of social grouping. So the most advantaged, if you like, have a much higher proportion of students who are living away from home or not living at home. And the impact is seen most significantly um, with BAME students. This is the BAME, BAME is the categorization that the Sutton Trust used for this data. And what you can see here is that almost 70% of BAME students were living at home during this, the uh, pandemic in January. And so linked to this, the Sutton Trust reported that more than 20% of students were affected by having inadequate study space. And again, this is differentiated by social class and ethnicity. So the pandemic had real impact on the student learning and the student capacity to learn. <clears throat> Just tidying up from that Sutton Trust report, what you can see here is the proportion of students experiencing inadequate study space during the pandemic. And you can see the differential 20% nationally, but for students who attended private schools, this is at 15%. For social grouping C2DE, this is about 24%, and for BAME, it's at 27%. So again, we've got that differential that's affecting how students can learn and their capacity to learn. So if we think about 
the development for students. Students also reported significant impacts on their wider development. So 80, 87% of students reported negative impact on skills development, particularly wider social development. And this is taken from the Sutton Trust and UPP's foundation survey, which was also just published earlier this year. And again, that social development has been affected, particularly for first year students who have missed out on a lot of the integrative first year activities and 85% of those students felt it had made it harder for them to establish friendship groups. Now we know that those are really important. If we go back to the UNITE student survey, 92% of, pros of prospective students want to have a sense of belonging to fit in with that community and 60% of them are anxious about it. And if such a large proportion of the students are finding it hard to establish friendship groups, then that's going to affect how they can work. And students have also encountered barriers in participating in extracurricular activities and so on. So 87% of students found that challenging. Only 30% were, were engaged in sports and societies compared with 54% previously, and that drops to 25% if we look at the students who are living at home. And that's part of the integration, that's part of the transition, is the ability to engage with fellow students in different activities. The latest student ac and academic experience survey also picked up on this, saying that poor experience was strongly related to too little in-person interaction with other students alongside in-person contact with staff. And in the, in the same vein, students reported that having approachable academic staff was the highest element in terms of contributing to their sense of belonging. This again is a story that I'm sure you all know well, Student mental health has been significantly affected. 73% of the 18 to 24 year olds reported a worsened mental health during lockdown. And that 78% reported that that worsened mental health made it harder to maintain friendships. So that's a sort of double whammy, if you like, the two, one feeding off the other, because if they can't maintain friendships, you've got a vicious cycle because then they show a further deterioration in their mental health. And 55% reported feeling lonely on a daily or weekly basis. And that's much higher for some of the minority groups where the proportion was 89%. 60% of students know how to access support, but the biggest challenge has been that lack of face-to-face -face contact. Now there are <clears throat> some other factors coming to it as well though. One of which is that students will be more experienced in studying online and independently, but the changes in assessment will have had unexpected outcomes. <clears throat> so for example, we've been tracking bioscience students over a number of years, comparing their knowledge retention and concept understanding, um, both pre and post now the pandemic. And <clears throat> what we saw, was that the 2020 entry cohort who'd had the A-level exams cancelled showed no difference in terms of their um, retention of knowledge compared with the ones who'd had their A-level exams. And that ties in with our understanding that the cramming for A-level exams doesn't necessarily help the students with actually the knowledge base that they have. And 5% of students who considered dropping out during the last academic year were prompted by finding the course too challenging, which is actually very low compared with 30% whose thinking was based on mental health issues. We've also, before I just come on to the sort of key points, we've also seen a reduction in the attainment gap in the 2020 finals results. It's still too large, but that's 
a quite a marked drop. And the reasons for underlying that are not clear, but certainly a number of researchers are suggesting that this is related to the change in assessment formats with the move away from the typical exam paper and move towards more open book, more authentic assessments. And again, this is something we've heard a lot about during the conference. So where are we and where do we go from here? <clears throat> Those transitions we know are fragmented, but how can we draw them together to support all students and what is going to be important? Integration academically and socially is critical for those students. And we need to support them, but not from a deficit model, but rather recognise and build on what they can do. And so <clears throat> these are simply the my thinking about how we can go forward and I'm um, at risk of quoting from or paraphrasing a previous politician, um, communication, communication, communication is really key. I know lots of universities are working on this front already. But for incoming students, providing guidance and a reassurance about university life, making them count as individuals and showing that we know where they've come from and the challenges that they've faced so that we can build their confidence and help them cope socially and academically. Making sure there's clear guidance about the support systems in place. In particular, one of the features that came through from the MIND study was that while students knew about them, a, a significant proportion of students who were suffering didn't feel able to talk to people. So it's making sure that students feel able and that it's OK to talk and it's OK to it's OK to admit that things aren't quite as they should be. And the quality of feedback and using more personalised approaches. Again, this is a really important communication pathway. We know that quality of feedback has been a long term focus as one of the major areas of dissatisfaction. And the tone of feedback, the way it's written, is really critical. Just as just as a sort of anecdote, one of the things that I found made a real difference to the way I produced feedback was using voice recognition software for written feedback. So rather than typing it, I spoke it and that and people using oral feedback changes the tone and makes it more personal. And certainly I found it didn't take any more time. In fact, because I'm not very good at typing, it actually made things faster for me doing it that way than trying to type things forward. We know that there's been a real move around assessment. Institutions have changed the way that they operate and institutions must be aware not to move backwards in terms of that. Refocusing assessment, making it more authentic and personalised, but also thinking about fewer assessments. One of the other factors that came through from the student and academic experience survey was that assessment both summative and formatively has increased progressively over the last three years. Apart from anything else, this has increased the burden on staff in terms of marking. So think about the assessment, make sure they're focused on your learning outcomes, but think about reducing the level of assessment. Go for greater authenticity, thinking about skills and don't worry so much about knowledge. Again, an, a brief anecdote because I know I'm running out of time, but I had a um, colleague in biochemistry who said no one should be able to graduate without being able to write down the whole of the Krebs cycle. And you think, OK, yeah, they might be able to do it in finals, but they'll have forgotten it within three days of having crammed it. So don't worry about knowledge per se. Think about more about skills and the way in which that knowledge is used. And then finally, social integration and reintegration, supporting student unions, societies and sports, ensuring they're accessible. I know a number of universities, for example, are cutting the fees for students to um, have sports memberships and societies and thinking about the timing when those take place. 
So if teaching finishes at 5 p.m. and society doesn't meet till 8 p.m. and the students living at home, are they going to hang around on campus? So think about how we can support our students in terms of maximising their social integration. And then last but not least, supporting academic reintegration, making most of peer learning practical classes to rebuild that cohort adhesion. And again, this is where STEM has a real advantage. Recognising the pressures on staff, absolutely institutions need to do that. And that's something that holding on all vice chancellors and senior management. But I'd leave you with one final quote, which is make every contact count. So whenever you can, talk to the students and make them feel personally recognised and make that count so that they can feel part of the institution. Thank you very much for your time. I've got a couple of slides at the end here which have got um, reference material if anybody finds that interesting, but hopefully that's sort of drawn together some of the ideas that you've had and already putting in place. And I'm very happy to take some questions. Thank you. Wonderful, John. Thank you so much for that. You can see the applause. <laughs> Indeed, I think people are grateful now. We'll take a few moments, folks. Uh, I know that we will don't worry, we will finish at half past 12 and <laughs> we'll make sure that we bring the conference to a close, but it would be inappropriate not to have a few questions and stuff with, now that we've got a bit of time with John as well. So please, if you can, you can use the little icon there to raise your hand or uh, add stuff in the chat as well. I know I, I did notice actually during the, the talk, the chat was deathly quiet. <laughs> it's interesting actually, we're, we're all listening intently. So any kind of questions or, or, or thoughts or reflections on what John just spoken with us about. For me, there was a lot of parallels with some of the presentations and the talks that we've heard um, over the last day or two. Derek, would you like to join us and on yeah. the mic? Uh, let me just check if I can uh, make sure that people can switch on their cameras because that yeah. might be me. I'll just make sure that you're... Go ahead there, Derek, Don't, but let me do Hi, Derek. <laughs> okay, hello there. I want to pick you up on the assessment aspect because um, you want to give students feedback in order to give students feedback, they have to give you something to give feedback on. A lot of our experience is that if you set merely formative assessments, students don't recognise that as important. The currency that they use to evaluate the importance of a piece of work is uh, essentially, does it count? And I think if you want to generate student interactions, the opportunity to give feedback, you need what are low stakes assessments. So it's not that we should assess less in the sense that we should reduce all assessments. We should reduce high stakes assessments and use a lot of the time that we gain in giving low stakes assessments on which we can give feedback. I think that's a, yeah, that, that's a very good point. Yes, it's, it's, it's the overall volume of assessment and I know that you, you and Sarah Gretton have done a lot of work on that front, so I, I take that point entirely, yes. Thank you, Derek. Let me just check now. Any other hands? Let's see where we're at there. I mean, around that as well, I was going to ask you, John, a little bit around the, you know, that the points that you finished up with there, the reintegration and maybe the recognition, you opened the, the talk with saying about the, you know, the university experience being broader than just the academic experience and how that's been changing is kind of clearly shown through the data and stuff that you shared with us. But I think this this last slide for me was something that pulls us up in, in something that I hadn't considered is, is that how, you know, across the institutions, the suggestion here is that we discuss and talk about the social and the academic and how we can coordinate across the two. I wonder if that's, is that something that you have done at Leicester maybe previously or is there, you know, for me that maybe the OU doesn't <laughs> have that same same remit, but it's an interesting point to bring through in terms of this connection, you know. Certainly, I think the the, the social integration is is really important. I mean, it, so that I, I quoted Tinto because he goes going right back to the 1980s and indeed more recent research shows that students who engage in societies are more likely 
to feel a part of the university and they, they'll stick with it when things go wrong because they've got another outlet, they've got another group of friends who aren't necessarily associated with the academic. So it's, it's part of that overall framework of feeling part of the institution and that and it contributes to that sense of belonging. And so that social integration is a really important element. And that's why I say that working with student unions and unit student societies at this stage is, is particularly important in order to make sure that the students feel part of the university and will stick with it. That's great. Good. OK, that's one last chat uh, chance there, folks. Any any further hands or or just checking the various buttons and things ahead of us there? Uh, so I think we're I think we're good. Could I ask you all please to open your microphone if you're able and we'll we'll give uh, John a physical applause as well for for thanking him for the keynote. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone thank for you. staying with us. Brilliant. If we can uh, I'll maybe just bring those slides down. So folks, this is the, the last section of the conference. Uh, I've got one thing to do very quickly, and then I'm going to ask Derek Rain to join us and explain a little bit about an opportunity for publishing in a journal. So Derek, stand by. We'll come to you in a moment. Um, Diane, I'm hoping that you'll... Um, uh, maybe bring up a slide or two there that I might need next, Diane. Oh, wonderful. That's great. So, uh, Diane, I think next I was just going to announce the poster award, and I'm hoping, Diane, that you may have the relevant slide or the piece of information that I might need. Just check or tell me control, otherwise. Trevor, then you can click through and it ah. will be revealed. Oh, gosh, look at that. Okay, bear with this. In that case, folks, let me. Uh, just to take the opportunity before Derek joins us, just to announce the, the winner of the poster uh, competition. And, and very much uh, thanks to everyone uh, that has done the posters. And there were some fantastic and incredibly creative ways of communicating the work that we've been doing. So let me uh, try and click on. I believe this is supposed to reveal something. Oh, it is. The best poster prize goes to poster number five. So if you're just checking your orders, you might get the pre-warning. Pre the microbiology introduction sessions on Zoom, swabs, masks, and belly button fluff. Oh, the group of chefs at hand. So I'm hoping Mel or Tim or maybe someone from the group there may be around uh, and might be <laughs> might be able to uh, maybe able to take the applause. But perhaps we can do our yeah. Look at that wonderful open mic applause. Or wonderful. Well done, Mel. Well and between. You. So rest assured, there is an amazing prize uh, available for that, and that will be winging its way to, to use directly uh, in, in the not too distant future. Right, so the last little section there, I'm going to hand over now to, to Derek and uh, maybe just stop the presentation there. Um, that's hopefully that. And Derek, I believe you'll briefly explain to us a little bit around the um, uh, the, the journal opportunity that we have as well. And again, Diane's bringing up the slide. Here we go. Over to you, Derek. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just going to very briefly um, mention that the New Directions in Teaching and Learning journal, it's an online journal, it's specifically oriented towards um, researchers, uh, educators who are new to publishing pedagogic research or who uh, whose day job is not um, research per se, but teaching, and have ideas that they think will be of interest. So, in fact, uh, many of the talks that we've um, heard in this conference would make ideal submissions as publications to the New Directions Journal. We publish full-blown educational research papers, but we also publish what I call research notes, which are just these short papers where you want to get an idea out into the community, where it's useful for the community, but that um, is not yet uh, something that you've turned into uh, a full-blown research paper. So can I encourage you to look online at the New Directions Journal? Papers are published uh, as soon as they're accepted. We rarely um, 
uh, reject papers. What we normally do is try and work with authors where papers need revision to make those revisions so that everyone gets an opportunity to get their work out there into the community. The journal is indexed so that papers can be found by uh, searching the standard um, bibliographers. Um, one other point, uh, not on the slide, um, we have uh, got, with the help of um, the uh, Advanced HE, a couple of seminars on getting into um, publishing academic research and getting into uh, pedagogic research on the 6th and the 8th of July. Um, if you go to the Society for Natural Sciences on HE, Connect on Advance HE Connect, you'll find the details there. So if you'd like to join us for that and discover something from those workshops, if you're not already um, uh, uh, experienced researchers and want to get into publishing your stuff because it's new, interesting, and will be of use to people, then please do join us uh, for those sessions. Uh, thank you very much. I'll hand back now uh, to our host. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Derek. And thanks again to the journal for the you know opportunity uh, to bring to the conference each year. And that that workshop sounds a fantastic uh, opportunity as well. So do spot the dates in the chat that have been added to the chat there as well. Thanks, everyone. Um, it's my great pleasure now to, to wrap up the conference maybe and just uh, close things. I do have a few thank yous to, to, to mention. Um, and I will get through those quickly, but it would be inappropriate not to do so. Um, yeah, just I'll name a few people and if they're in the room, please feel free to switch on your video and uh, receive the uh, applauds and, and support and appreciation that um, so many of us, uh, you know, will give to you at, at this stage. So, so Nick Braithwaite did a great job opening the conference and I just wanted to, to mention him uh, as a way of setting us off on this path and, and thank Nick for the opening address that he gave us. Paul Taylor and John uh, John Scott, who gave us the two keynote talks. They're just really good way to bookend the conference, starting up with the inclusion, closing with the transitions, both things considering how the current context of the work and the, and the things that we've been doing, and, and both so much reflected in the talks through the conference as well. So thanks to, to both the keynote speakers for those. I'd also like to thank Connected with that, obviously the presenters. Uh, of all of the forms of presentation of the talks, the workshops and the posters, um, you know, it's been such a great way to, to come together. And uh, so the amount of effort and time that goes into preparing these things, sometimes to, to pressure deadlines, you know, to get stuff to us early. But uh, the result actually, you know, the last couple of days has been so good, so, so much appreciated. We really do do value that. And the other ones to mention then is the session chairs. Um, the colleagues on the on the program committee and also a few other colleagues from the OU who have been kind enough to give us a bit of time and support by chairing the sessions and the whole thing actually came together by the tone set by those groups and I uh, really do appreciate um, the support uh, uh, and the, the work that's been done in chairing the sessions. So that I mean, so the last couple of groups is just the program committee. Uh, Horizons and STEM, as you know, is a community of universities. We have a program committee that's represented from about a dozen or so universities. We're always open to uh, to bring more people onto the committee. If folks are interested in, in becoming part of the organizing group for this, please do get in touch with us. It's something that we do need to maintain and sustain to keep this event happening. Um, the committee have been wonderful this year at supporting the OU in running this, particularly our colleagues at Nottingham uh, who ran this event last year online. And we learned so much from the process there and also from the feedback that was provided from people attending the conference. So you will all receive an email in the next day or two to invite you to give us some feedback on this conference. Please, please complete the feedback because it's so used and it's such a process. The committee get together, we reflect on the feedback that we receive each time. We use that to shape the next conference. So tell us the things that you like, tell us the things that you'd like to see next time and, and they'll be reflected in what we do uh, in next year. At the moment, we don't have a, a, a venue to announce for next year's conference. We are seeking offers uh, from any groups that may be interested in hosting the, uh, the Horizons and STEM conference next year. The intent is that it will be a face to face event, so it would be great to bring us the community together again in person for two days again next year if we can. So yeah, if you're interested in that again, please get in touch with us. Uh, the, uh, that would be really good to hear from folks that are interested in hosting us next year. The last group then for been mentioned is the local organizing committee. Uh, myself and Mark Jones as the directors of the STEAM uh, Centre, we've been kind of figureheading some of the, the stuff you've seen over the last couple of days. 
but we're a very small part of uh, important stuff that happens. Um, Nick Hook uh, is one of the uh, people in his team who's been doing a great job uh, supporting the, the, each of the sessions and working with us to bring together the conference uh, proceedings and information and stuff for people. So Nick's done a great job. Also, our colleagues in the communication team, Babette Oliver and Amy Sharp, have done a great job in uh, supporting us in the sessions, bringing up slides, helping people uh, throughout the sessions and just being that friendly background voice uh, that again set the tone and supported the conference through so much. So those people that we maybe don't see are the folks that actually really make it happen so much and uh, it's really, really valued. And then the last person uh, to mention on that group is Diane Ford, the uh, Senior Manager for Scholarship at the OU and uh, the Manager for the Esteem Centre who has been uh, fantastic throughout and been your main contact for a lot of the stuff that you've done for the conference so uh, we should finally thank uh, Diane as the, the last person so please uh, the last little thing to ask you then is to open microphone applause again uh, and let's just thank those people and everyone else that's made a great conference thank you very very much indeed. wonderful everyone thanks so much uh, Please take a moment to think about what you're going to put into practice from this conference. Uh, you've got a little bit of time now for lunch. We're actually finishing two minutes early, which you can't believe. Um, we've had a fantastic time together and had some really great conversations, which you know online is not easy. Um, so please take a moment, think back over your conference. Whatever you've been able to attend is what you've been able to do, and we appreciate people's time at this time. But have a think about what it is that, uh, what questions, what thoughts, what information, what contacts you can maybe take from this. And hopefully there's ways that you can reflect on that, bring it into your teaching and we'll see you again next year. Thank you all very much. Goodbye and uh, yeah, thanks again. Just check if anyone's still there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well there we go. Well done, folks. Brilliant. <sighs> Thanks for all that. It's good. That's fantastic at the end. Oh, then, Trevor, hey. really well done. Just to say that's that what you said at the end there. It's the, really great. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, you know it was heartfelt. <laughs> you know it was heartfelt. <laughs> oh, you, uh, sorry. Yeah, Can you stop the recording, please? That's okay. <laughs>